Mr. Greetings to you, and welcome to Happily Ever Teaching, where we help you enthrall your learners in every subject under the sun using the best teaching method known to science storytelling. To do this, we feature special guest educators who are passionately keen for your children to become amazing and successful human beings. I am storyteller Chip Cahoon, and with me this week is. Hi, I'm Bex. And I'm a primary school teacher from Cambridgeshire. I've experienced teaching across the age range, being a deputy head, and I'm also the curriculum and teaching and learning lead. And I have the privilege of training and releasing the next generation of teachers as well. And today we are exploring English learning outcomes with this week's folk tale from Japan. You can listen to the story by downloading our sister podcast, Fables and Fairy Tales, or search our website, epictales.co.uk, for The Underwater Kingdom. There you'll find a video of me telling the story that you can share with your children. And if you sign up as an epic educator, you'll also get a copy as an ebook or paperback illustrated by Winnie the Witch's very own Corky Paul, as well as the full audiobook for you to download at any time, and even some tips for telling the story yourself. Right now, though, let's continue our discussion with Bex here. What English learning is there in Yurashima's tale? Well, as with everything, like I do love Yurashima's story so much because there's so many opportunities for、um, cross curricular learning, which is again why we love stories so much, isn't it? So I'm going to start <laughs> off、um, with some poetry that I think is something that can, we can use across the age ranges because I think、okay. the,、um, the story linked. And the illustrations. I think if you can get hold of the illustrations too, the Corky's illustrations, it will really, really help you with, particularly with the、um, English and the poetry.、Hmm. Um, so, with poetry, something again that's really easy for children to access, whether they're an amazing、um, writer or not. Poetry can be quite short, it can be quite simple. So, even the very early on in our early years, children, so our four year olds, they can still access、um, poetry in some way. And it's, it's often a part of the curriculum that we kind of gloss over or do quite quickly, I've noticed.、Um, that might just be、mm. me in my school, but I'm certain that it's not.、Um, <laughs> So, there's a, there's a poem called a fast poem that you can make. So, I think this would be something you could do with your early years children with support from their adults and your、mm-hmm. um, year one and year two children. So, that's your、uh, four to seven year olds.、Um, and what a fast poem is, is it looks at、um, different word classes. So, it looks at you collect all the adjectives when you're looking at a picture. So, say about, we'll, we'll create one about the sea. That's what I would do.、Um, use、mm-hmm. one of Corky's illustrations, use some sounds of the sea. Get some, if you can, like、uh, some salt water that the children can smell and pictures of sea creatures and just really immerse them in the sea. So, I'd probably do this first thing in the morning, get them all coming into the classroom with all of this、um, the visual. Can I just confirm、them. when you say pictures of sea creatures, you mean like photographs or something and、yes. not, not pictures like big jugs of water with sea creatures inside? No, that's, it. that's exactly what I mean. Pictures, okay, like、good. photographs of sea creatures, or、um, Corky's drawing of the, I love Corky's drawing of the turtle.、Um, mm. So that's a really lovely one. So just put them around the room and get the children to come in and then get them to be、um, like senses detectives. So get them to collect things they can hear,、uh, things they can、yeah. see, things they can smell, things they can feel.、Um, mm-hmm. So, and get them like, Off they go. So,、uh, whatever year, if they're in reception year one or year two, they'll, they'll all enjoy that. And、um, then collect them all and come back together. And then you create a poem using some of the children's ideas. So, you say, The sea is the thing that we're writing a poem about. And then you collect two adjectives about the sea. Then you collect three verbs about the sea. And then th-、uh, four adverbs about the sea. And you create a, a fast poem. So, it's done really quickly. That's the, the kind of aim. But really looking at Really looking at the word classes the children will have learnt. And you can obviously don't have to do as many word classes for your reception children. So maybe you could just do the C and then some adjectives and verbs if you got onto that. And then、mm-hmm. you can extend the children as they're working further up in your key stage one age range. So it's the idea of this that it's kind of like a pyramid. You, you obviously have the noun, which in this case is the C, but then、yep. you have two adjectives, three verbs, four adverbs. And you can carry on if you want to, but I've only used up to adverbs at the moment. <laughs> so you would do one together, and then the children could go away and create one of their own, which would be really lovely.、Yeah. So I think that that's a, it's a really, really quick and easy way of getting into poetry. You can even just use 
the word C, have the noun C, and then have all the adjectives, get the children just to write some adjectives mm. about the C, some just ways to describe the C. And again, really simple, really effective, getting the children looking at their spelling, punctuation and grammar that they have to do that can, in a mm-hmm. really interesting way. It's a great way to explore language, certainly. But it's also, I think, a good way to explore the relationship between the different classes of words. Because sometimes if we put too many adjectives into a description, it can start to become a very clunky piece of writing and it can actually end up being quite distracting where there will often be a verb that just calls to mind exactly the same level of description that you would get from an adjective, but does it in a way that creates a moving picture in your head. And you keep coming back to Corky's illustrations. One of the reasons why I would certainly encourage people to have a look at the illustrations and use them for this kind of activity is because Corky's really brilliant attitude to art is that the picture should always be moving. There should always be something going on in the image. It shouldn't just be like a... a, He didn't just like draw a picture of a turtle with Hiroshima sat on his back. The turtle is swimming with Hiroshima riding on his back. And it's the the verbs in that sentence that you can really see powerfully coming through his artwork. And it just makes it so much more engaging, doesn't it? So it's bound to get you more engaged with language. Yeah, definitely. So I think get the pictures get I think that's our message yep. get hold of Corky's <laughs> illustrations to help help with this um, and obviously further up the school as well with your 8 to um, 11 year olds so our key stage 2 children you can also explore lots and lots of different types of poems so the children could do a writer like a riddle or a kenning poem Ooh. about um, about the sea so that's where you don't give away all the information yeah. um, and the children then create something for other people to solve and guess what they're writing about mm. so you could make the task a bit more open so you could say uh, pick a character from the story or pick a a place in the story so they could write about the dragon palace or they could write about the um, sea as a like um, as a whole or they could write about a creature that Hiroshima might have seen on his journey towards the dragon palace and that the children have to guess what they're writing about which is Really, really yeah. good. I love doing Kenning poems with my, particularly doing Kenning poems with my year and um, three and four children um, a few years ago. They're, they're brilliant for, for that year group. So and they're then kind of like about, fast poems without the noun, aren't they? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so like a, um, a something stealer, a mm-hmm. gold stealer or a jewellery stealer. And then you've got your, like, because a magpie, that was what I was thinking of for some mm-hmm. reason. And also you could create um, like a poem where children finish. I think this would support any learner at any age in the primary school where they can finish off the sentence for you. So the, the C is and they, they finish it off. The mm. C is. So it starts each line with the C is or the Dragon Palace is, just so that uh, to support the children with a writing frame if they were to need one. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's, I think it's really important to consider how we would support those children who might need that little bit of extra help to get started. Absolutely. So um, another thing that you could do thinking about finishing at the end of a, a line in a poem is um, the kind of next idea is about finishing the end of the story. So I, I'm somebody who really, oh. really wants to know what happens to Hiroshima now he's back. <laughs> what actually happens? Because we're kind of left on a really big cliffhanger, which I, I love mm. about, um, story, about story writers and storytelling that actually then it gives the children the chance to explore where they would go next. Mm. So I'd get the children, I'd read it to the children. So I think this would be particularly effective for our younger learners, so for our um, early years to year two, so our four to seven-year-olds, um, where you can read the story a few times, get the children really to know the story. Maybe you might want to put some storytelling actions to it to help them to remember it. And mm-hmm. then you, you then you um, take it into them inventing their own what happens next. So you kind of do a, okay, what are you going, what do we think actually happens to Rishima? So he's had his journey, he's forgotten what's happened, he's 700 years in the future, um, so nothing looks the same. What's it going to be like getting them mm. to explore all the, the, you could get them to look at Japan 700 years ago and seven and now and just have a little bit of a think about what maybe would have happened to Hiroshima next or what they wish would happen to him. Do they wish he'd get his memory back suddenly and hmm. and end up going back, returning back into the um, Dragon Palace and marrying and um, meet, re-meeting his, um, his bride and, and living underwater or are they going to keep him and get him to travel back in time and be able to re-meet his friends and family? Who knows? There's 
so many yeah. uh, so many opportunities for them yeah, and it's really such are. an easy an easy task that you can really get the children motivated with as well so i think it's it's a great one yeah, to definitely. just where are we going next because they'll have spent so long with Hiroshima already by that point in the story children never want to leave a, a character that they've just spent so much of their creative energies building up in their head so yeah absolutely they will want to find out what happens to him next it might be interesting though to look at the or to explore the the difference between what needs to happen next and what they want to happen next. Because obviously if he's lost his memory, there's probably going to have to be a fair amount of education that will go yeah. on. Even before he makes any uh, attempt to go out and live in the world, which might result in time travel or seeing him go back under the sea. Mm. So yeah, having the opportunity to find out what happens next and whether he gets any form of help at all will be really, really interesting. But I love that you're starting that so young down in the school. Yeah, I think, um, obviously, you, it's so easy with the with the younger children because they've got such ama- I mean, all children have amazing imaginations, but I think in yeah. our early years class and in our year one classes, you just see this real creativity that you just want to harness mm-hmm. in the children. Um, and, and I was thinking you could always get uh, Yurishima in. Okay, we found this person in Japan and flown him over, um, but he's he's got no... Me- how are we going to help him what are we going to what are we going Uh. to do so have the teacher or um sometimes i ask my office staff to be in role or my (laughs) caretaker or or the head teacher like just find somebody who's happy to come and pretend to be someone else for a little bit Um, and you can get hot seating and teacher in role and you can write the children can write questions um and do a role on the wall where you have the massive outline of a person Mm -hmm. you write all the things you know about Hiroshima in the middle and all the things we think around the outside they could be responsible for helping him to get his um, memory back and reminding yeah. him of all the things that he's done because they know his story. Yeah. But And then some of the children might also fancy becoming Hiroshima and um, answering some of the questions that the children have yeah. as well. So I think there's so many opportunities and then they can use that all that information to write their next bit, even if it's just a few lines. It would just mm-hmm. really... I think... If children are interested and engaged, as we know with teachers, if you love what you're teaching, you teach it so much better and you and you're um, much more enthusiastic about it. The same with the children, because they'll love they'll love thinking, well, what's going to happen next? Mm -hmm. And I I really like what you said. I think it's really important to pause the children and say, okay, what do we need to do for this person that we found Mm -hmm. who doesn't know who they are or where they are? And what would we like to happen? Which I think is I mean, the the whole of this activity, I'm sure, is one that could travel all the way up the school as well to mm. um, to year six to the ten and eleven year olds. But ha- have you thought of a different way of approaching it with with that age range? Then I guess, like you say, it's still got the same thread of kind of what happens next. But I was kind of thinking more of it of going down the newspaper article route for the eight to eleven year olds. So for our year three to okay. year six. So really looking at, okay, what do we know? What clues can we find? We might want to fight, um, interview like Hiroshima at different points in the story. So we might want to interview him as he's um, found the tur- rescued the turtle on the beach. So man rescues turtle as our headline. Mm. And then um, like talking to the children um, and talking to Hiroshima. And, and then we might want to meet him as he's in the underwater world and write a newspaper article about his journey <laughs> there. And then we might want to write about when we find him 700 years later because obviously the children will need to think about the differences uh, in the Japanese culture mm. seven, it's 700 years apart as well so that will be particularly good for the older children doing some research what questions will they need to ask what is he used mm. to when he arrives out of the water and um, what will be a surprise to him so particularly like planes and big built skyscrapers and modes of transport and all of those yeah. things like lots to explain and lots to understand and there's an element of needing to to dramatize about this as well because they will have to imagine that they are living 700 years ago in Japan if they're going to be interviewing him on the beach rescuing the turtle. They'll also Mm. be, I suppose, having to imagine what it's like being an underwater journalist. Um, I don't know which sea creature would have the... the, Probably the octopus, because they're the ones that can produce the ink, aren't they? (laughs) Yes. And lots of legs to do, lots of different things at one time. Absolutely, yeah. Typewriting over here, yeah. Google searching over there, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. 
but then the the really interesting one, I suppose, will be actually having to be a, a modern Japanese journalist and meeting someone with amnesia who has no real story at all and and is just babbling nonsense. I I don't know. Maybe maybe for the the sake of storytelling, you'd have to allow him to remember his own name, so he could say that he's Hiroshima. Yes, perhaps. Um, and they can say something like, "Well, the, the last time anyone had heard of a Hiroshima was when this man went out and got caught in a storm seven hundred years ago." Um, people thought the name is cursed. No one's called their children Hiroshima for seven hundred years. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> giving them the the opportunity to actually create a character for themselves. Before they go creating the newspaper article as well, that's going to be really broadening their allegorical and their creative mindsets in so many different ways,、um, and really highlighting the usefulness of learning English because they'll be they'll be giving it some practical applications in a really fun way. Yeah. And I think this—I mean, all of these ideas would kind of come at the in my head. They'd come at the end of a、mm. unit of work. So you'd have done, you'd have explored the character of Hiroshima、um, in the different the three different points、yeah. in the story.、Um, I would it, with the older children, I do that in more depth. With the younger children, I might do an emotion graph to track how he's feeling at those different points、mm. in the story. So this would be like the the end piece of all their learning on about this story about Hiroshima. That's where where they'd go with the. Um, with the older children, with their newspaper article,、and、I think they would just love it. Particularly like、um, exploring the character a little bit more, and as probably as a, like a hook into the newspaper article, get them to write one about the the scene in、um, the Marvel film where Captain America has been frozen for seventy、oh, yeah. years and then arrives in the、um, in the middle of the skyscrapers in I guess it's New York. In my head,、mm-hmm. that's where he is, but he probably isn't that scene and show them like actually what. But obviously, he had to be、mm-hmm. calmed down because he didn't know what was going on. So I think it would give them a good understanding of how someone、Definitely. might react. And and one that's probably a little bit more child friendly than the、um, Jason Bourne series, which has the very yes, similar、yeah. premise. I wonder though, would you consider sort of doing it the other way round and giving children the mystery of this man with amnesia who is, you know,、uh, calling himself Hiroshima and no idea where he's come from, where his family are, where he lives, etc. But all we know about Hiroshima is that seven hundred years ago there was another man with the same name. Um, and seeing if they can, I don't know, pick out clues、um, and and interview a, another hot seated office member,、um, having a go, or maybe you'd have to do it yourself.、Uh, I, I don't know, but it could be quite fun, couldn't it? Do you, do you think that would be an, an engaging way of bringing them into the story if they actually have to? Work out the details of the plot themselves. I mean, all children and grown-ups love a treasure hunt, don't they?、Yeah. And love piecing things together, and love like a, a like an escape room type thing. So maybe we can leave them some clues. I'd probably, if I was going to do something like that, I'd leave them clues around the classroom that they'd find first of all, and then get someone to come in a little bit later. So they've already started piecing the jigsaw together, and then have Hiroshima arrive、yeah. so that they can.、Um, Move forward, but yes, I'd obviously ask a an office member or, or do it myself. You then have to obviously make sure you've got someone looking after your class if they're、uh, <laughs> while you're out becoming your Ashima. Could be a good one for bringing a, 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 another storyteller or arts practitioner into your school as well, because、mm. it's a very popular folk legend. This one, so I'm sure there will be plenty of people who will be able to bring in. And actually, there are versions of this folk tale from different parts of the world.、Um, in the UK, we have. A, a, a an Arthurian version of it, a, a sort of Arthurian legend,、um, which involves a, a knight chasing after a stag and finding himself in this land where he again falls in love,、um, is warned not to leave, and when he eventually does leave, finds that he has travelled several years in the past. It's quite amazing, actually, that it's such a universal folk tale、um, about time travel from way, way early in time, way back in the medieval days. So yeah. Absolutely fascinating. You could perhaps see if your children could adapt it to other landscapes, couldn't you?、Mm, oh, definitely. That's all we have time for today, folks. If you try out any of these ideas, or if you'd like us to help you teach a topic you are soon to cover with your young learners, please let us know on social media using @teachhappily, or leave us a review using your favourite podcast app. 
Please also share this podcast with your colleagues and help us start a story-led revolution in classrooms around the world so children everywhere can learn in a way that's effective, memorable and enjoyable all at the same time. Tomorrow, Hiroshima will help us teach maths. But right now, it only remains for us to say cheerio and we hope to hear your story soon. So, cheerio! Cheerio. And And we we hope hope to hear your 